In this video, we're going to talk about electron configurations and learn how to write those. So the off-ball principle is a method of building electron configurations by adding electrons one at a time as the atomic number increases. So when we start adding electrons to an atom, the electrons always go into the lowest energy orbitals first, and we keep going adding electrons until we fill up all the electrons that we're supposed to have. But we can only have a maximum of two electrons per orbital. So when we start writing orbital diagrams, we depict the arrangement of electrons by drawing boxes to represent the orbitals, and then we put arrows to represent the electrons. So if we only have one electron, for example, in hydrogen, we draw our box, and then we just have one electron to put in the box. When we go to helium, we now have two electrons to put in our box, and remember, electrons cannot have the same spin. Electrons, they have to have, if one of them has an upspin, the other has to have a downspin. So if you think back to your quantum numbers, remember the four quantum numbers can't be the same. So if we're talking about the 1s orbital, n equals 1 for both of those electrons because they're in the 1s orbital. L equals 0 because this is an s orbital. And if L equals 0, the only possible value for m sub L is also 0, which means that m sub s, which is their magnetic spin quantum number, has to be different. So one of them has to be positive 1 half, and one of them has to be negative 1 half, which means that they have to have opposite spins. So we put one of the electrons going up and one of the electrons going down. So Hun's rule tells us that degenerate orbitals, which are orbitals of the same energy, degenerate orbitals is our term for orbitals that have the same energy. When we're putting electrons into degenerate orbitals, the lowest energy configuration maximizes the number of unpaired electrons. So for example, if I take something like carbon, which has six electrons, so it's gonna have a 1s and a 2s and a 2p, So 2p, remember, p orbitals can hold 6 electrons, p shells, excuse me. They have 3 orbitals. So if I have something like carbon, I start with the lowest energy shell that I have, and I put 2 in electrons into the 1s and 2 into the 2s. But when I get to the 2p, now, would not just put the two electrons that are left into the 2p orbital, because we want to maximize the number of unpaired electrons. So I would put one of those electrons in the second orbital. So this gives me my total of six electrons. Now, if I go to nitrogen, I have seven electrons, so I put the next unpaired electron in the last 2p orbital. And then if I went to oxygen, now I have eight, so now I have to start pairing them up. So then I would put my second electron in one of the 2p orbitals, and we would keep going from there. 
but we always start with the electrons unpaired and then we go back and start pairing up if we have to pair up. So there's carbon and there's nitrogen and we would keep going from there. So you see if you go down the first 10 elements of the periodic table, hydrogen we only have a 1s, helium we pair up the two electrons in the 1s, we keep going through lithium and beryllium, boron we finally get to one electron in the p shell. Then once we get to nitrogen, we've now filled up the 2p shell. So now we have to start pairing up electrons all the way up to neon where we've now filled up the 2p shell. So when we fill orbitals, we fill them from lowest energy to highest energy. So within a given shell, that usually goes S, P, D, and then F. However, there's a few exceptions to, the, to that. 3D is actually slightly higher in energy than 4S. It's only a small difference, but because of that difference, the 4S shell actually gets filled before 3D. And the 6S shell actually gets filled before 4F. So the way that I do the electron shells to help remember which ones to fill in which order is there's a little table that you can write out. So we start with 1S. There is no 1P, so we don't write that. In the next shell, we have 2S and 2P, then 3S, 3P, and 3D. Once we get to 4, we now have an F shell. And let me write this up higher where we have a little more space. So we have 1S, 2S, 2P, 3S, 3P, 3D, 4S, 4P, 4D, 5S, 5P, 5D, 5F, when we get to 6, And then what we can do is we draw arrows and we go along the diagonals. So 1s, 2s, then we go to 2p, 3s, we go 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, 6s. 4F, 5D, 6P, 5F, 6D, 6F. And then 6F. So you can go along the diagonals to determine which orbital your electrons are going into. Okay, so we can actually label the periodic table by orbitals because if we write out the electron configurations, we can see where the number of electrons, where we would end. So the first two rows are the S block. So all of those are going to end on an S shell. And if you start with hydrogen, you can actually count down and see where the electrons should end, what the end should be. So in this row, n equals 1, in this row, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, and so forth. Over here on the right side of the periodic table, we have the P block. And you have to remember that starting with boron is actually the second row, so that starts with 2P. 
the middle of the transition modules, we have the D block. And then the inner transition metals, we have the F block. So you can use this as a guide to see where you should be ending up when you're writing out your electron configurations. Now there are a few elements that do not follow the pattern. Things like chromium and copper are a couple of examples. Technically, if we went by the, sh the order that we wrote out a few seconds ago, we would fill up the S shell, and then we would start putting electrons in the D shell. But what we actually find is a half-filled S shell, and then more electrons in our D shell. This comes from having some stability with a half-filled D shell. I do not expect you to memorize the ones that don't follow the pattern. I just want you to be aware that there are some that don't. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. And we're just going to do a couple of these and then we'll get some more practice with the rest of them in class. So if we look up potassium on the periodic table, potassium has 19 electrons. So if we draw out our table so that we remember which orbital, which electrons go into which orbitals in what order, and you can draw that out on the side of your tape of your paper. And this is the table that I'm referring to. So I'm not going to draw it on this slide because I don't have a whole lot of room. But let's go ahead and start with the 1s shell. So if you've drawn your table, we have, we start with the 1s shell. So 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 6 is 10, so we've got 10 electrons so far. So we're going to keep going. So we have 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 6 is 10, plus 2 is 12, plus 6 is 18, which means that we only have one electron left to go into the 4s orbital. So if we were going to write out our orbitals, and sometimes we abbreviate these just drawing lines rather than boxes. So we would draw two electrons in the 1s shell, two in the 2s shell. Then remember the p shell has three orbitals. So this is our 2p shell, but we have six electrons. So we have our 3s, where we would put two electrons, and then we have our 3p, and we have six electrons that need to go in that orbital, and then we have the 4s electrons, and we only have one in the 4s. Now the other thing that we need to talk about with electron configurations is the noble gas abbreviation. So let's take a look, for example, at lead. So lead, if you look at the periodic table, has 82 electrons. So if we start writing out our orbitals, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And I'm going to go ahead and go through a few of these because it's going to take a while to get all the way to 82. So 3s2... 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p6, 5s2, 4d, oops, let's see, 4d, Mm, so 4p, 5s, 
4D, 5P6. This one should be 6S2. Then 4F. Let me write this a little bit neater. Success two four F fourteen. So let's see, we have two plus two plus six would be ten, twelve, eighteen, twenty, thirty, thirty six, thirty eight, forty eight, fifty four, fifty six. That would be seventy. So five D ten would be 80, which means we have two left to go into the 6P2. So that's a pretty long configuration to have to write out. So let's go back to our periodic table a few slides ago. And let's pick a right one. Okay, so we have lead, which is down here in the 6P row. So if we want to write out the noble gas configuration, we look at the row right above the element we're looking at, and we find the noble gas at the end of that row. So the noble gas here is xenon. So if you look at a periodic table that has the atomic numbers on it, xenon has the atomic number 54. So if we go back to our slide where we have lead and we count up, so we had 10 here, 12, 18, 20, 30, 36, 30, 48, 54 at 5P6. So all of this up to 5P6 would be the electron configuration of xenon. So we can abbreviate the electron configuration by lead by putting xenon in brackets because xenon is the noble gas that has 54 electrons, which is just below lead. And then we write out the rest of the electron configuration. So 6s2, 4f14, 5d10, 6 P2. So this would be our noble gas configuration. So you can write either configuration when you're writing the electron configurations for elements that have a higher number of electrons. Either one of these would be acceptable answers. Now, we also need to talk about the formation of ions. So, if we write out electron configurations for our elements that are neutral, but we can also write out electron configurations for ions. So, if we gain or lose valence electrons, sometimes we get a more stable electron configuration. For example, if we have sodium, Sodium has 11 electrons in it, and the noble gas just before it is neon, which has 10. So if we write out the electron configuration for sodium, it would actually be neon 3s1. Well, if we lose this one electron here in the 3s shell, now we have the exact same electron configuration as neon. The same thing happens with chlorine. Chlorine is atomic number 17. It's right next to argon, which is atomic number 18. So if we write out the electron configuration for chlorine, it would be neon, because that's the noble gas right above it, 3s2, 3p5. Well, if we add an electron, now we have 3p6, which is the exact same electron configuration as argon. So now we filled up that P shell. So all of these elements here, magnesium, oxygen, and we could write those for most of the element, main group elements on the periodic table, 
If we gain or lose electrons, we get a noble gas configuration. So these elements that have identical configurations are noble gases and the ions that have gained or lost electrons to get noble gas configurations are what we call isoelectronic. Isoelectronic is a word that describes atoms or ions that have identical electron configurations. Now our transition metals don't get noble gas configurations when they gain or lose electrons. They still have too many electrons to get close to a noble gas configuration. But one thing with the transition metals that you have to be aware of is that when they do gain or lose electrons, they lose from the highest end value. So in our orbital filling table, we saw that we go to 4s before we go to 3d. So we go to 4s first, and then we come back to 3d. But when we lose electrons, we actually lose in the 4s shell, even though we feel the 3d shell lasts. We lose in the 4s shell first, before we start losing from the D shell. So when we form iron 3 plus, we've already lost these two electrons in the 4S. So then we have to start losing from the 3D. So I'm going to leave you with some examples here. And we will actually work some of these out in class. And I will see you in class.